Hi, everyone. I'm Nick Depensier, and I'm here with Ira Singh, and we're both honored to have been asked by the CSC to talk a bit about documentary cinematography. Um, and I think these moments, uh, especially coupled with all of our unique situation uh, now with self-isolation and a huge pause button having been hit on production, um, it's actually a great opportunity for reflection a bit about um, practice and approach and philosophy that sometimes you don't get a time to live that um, that examined life. Uh, so I've, I've enjoyed just the last couple of days thinking about what, um, uh, what we might talk about uh, along with Iris that, that might not be completely um, uh, predictable or uh, might, might tread some new ground, I hope. Um, it, we absolutely welcome this to be a conversation and uh, there are mechanisms for uh, asking questions in chats and various things that will get to us uh, via text and um, would be great to have that kind of interactivity and back and forth. So please don't hesitate to, to chime in with that. Um, Iris, any words of introduction? Should we launch no, into really, a first topic? It's just nice to have this opportunity to, or this moment to, to learn a little bit more, to stop um, doing all the time and to listen a bit and to share as well. And it's, I'm always happy when our paths cross, Nick. So this is really nice to have this conversation with you in front of all these people. <laughs> but thanks everybody for joining us. Like, yeah, likewise. Um, Iris and I were laughing because we have actually worked together on two shows, although I think both of us would say most of our gigs are our solo. Um, we often work alone in the camera, like we are the camera department um, when when we're on a show. But the joke is, is that um, once when we work together, uh, um, normally work alone, but on long time running the documentary about uh, the Tragically Hips last tour, there were opportunities to have multi-camera coverage, especially in the big arena scenes. And so I thought, oh, who are my favorite DPs? I could, I could invite, you know, just for a day or two and come to the Toronto concert down at the uh, ACC, as it was called then. Um, and, so, oh, and then Iris came and of course, like she was way up at the back in the bleachers and there was no light at all uh, for the shots that um, I was asking her to get. And then the other time we've worked together is on Liz Marshall's ghosts in our machine which is equally funny because we never actually met on on that we did different segments and we knew each other along with john price another favorite uh documentary dp of mine we knew we were working on it but we never never actually uh saw each other until we saw the finished product and then had to guess guess who shot what um one of the things i've been i've been thinking of Iris, I don't know if you would agree with this, but um, one of the things I love about being a documentary cinematographer is this unique relationship that you have with time and the whole idea of, of time, how um, unlike maybe a drama film set, which to me, you know, when I've, when I've worked on those, it always seems like time out of time. It's almost its own world. You know, you come out of the studio or the set and it's, you don't even know what time of day it is. And it, you, you realize you're, you're in this hermetic other world. Um, but documentary, you're in these real life moments. You're living them yourself. You're often traveling. You're, you often have re relationships that you develop with real characters as you're following them. And as a cinematographer, your job is to, is to interpret those moments, to, to capture them. Um, and you're not manufacturing them. You don't have control over them. Um, so th there's this, um, you know, uh, enormous responsibility. Sometimes if two of your main characters are sort of meeting for the first time, or, you know, there's going to be this, this moment, you have to, um, be the very best that you can be in this amazing liminal state because you're not going to get that back. So you don't just have to 
be there and make sure you're getting it. But if it's a, if it's a apex moment in the film, a climax, you want to make sure that you're doing the very best that you can and that, and that you're interpreting that, you know, with all of the art and, and, uh, you know, craft that you can bring to bear. Um, mm. you know, do, do you find that that same ecstasy sometimes yeah. in, in, in moments that you're filming? Yes. And there's so many ways to think about time as a documentary cinematographer, just in, in just personally too, and how you a lot and split up your life, in, into these moments, but I find that uh, the thing that I um, find the most important is the, the ability to to immerse yourself in the moment. And that that I, I don't know if that fits my personality or, or what, but it um, it means that you have to forget everything before and everything after this moment, and to be focused on uh, the dynamic and what is actually happening without the distractions of thinking about um, well, maybe thinking about an editor and how this might be used in the future, but um, but sort of making a lot of room for that moment in the moment. And I think um, it's it sort of in the way that I work, uh, which is more on long form documentaries where I'm jumping from one one film to another, um, sometimes three within the span of a week, let's say. Um, it's you do have to push away everything that came with before and after that because switching gears so quickly um that it can't afford you to be distracted by anything else and that's that's a really unique sort of um way to be i think um but it also makes times uh, like moments like this difficult because in having to talk about our work now <laughs> it's, i have to sort of get back into the mode of thinking about something that happened uh, maybe a year ago that I may have forgotten already because I'm immersed in something else now. So whenever this comes up, it's always a tricky thing to um, try to gather all those memories back again. So I hope, I hope but, that- but, but in a way, would, would you agree if you, if you deconstructed a bit, a lot, of, a lot of documentary practice as a cinematographer is, is making yourself available to be your best in that crucible moment of time. And that starts way before you've even left on the trip, thinking about the gear that you're going to want, you know, probably having a, a go-to comfortable camera set up that mm -hmm. can just become invisible, right? So it's, it's muscle memory and, and intuition. So you can, you can just be in that zone. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, like I think maybe we we do that sometimes consciously, um, uh, sometimes not. But so we can be as as I mean, in a way, unconscious of all of the machinations um, uh, as possible. And then I maybe more than you have the luxury. You know, I work a lot with the same director, my wife Jennifer, mm -hmm. um, and. It's funny. I think we've had almost an arc in in our career where, um, in the beginning, obviously we met at a job interview at the Bamboo Tavern where she needed a a, a DP, and so we had this working relationship and language before all the all the other stuff and the kids and everything. But through all those films, it became that that I could that I knew what she wanted. She wouldn't have to be whispering in my ear. You know, we probably all worked with directors who have little codes about, you know, go tight or go wide or they're whispering, you know. Um that to me as as a cinematographer, the best situation is to know you're on the same page with that director, to have had all those conversations and then they just let you go in that moment. They 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 ha they have to trust you because it's so fluid and and it's a real time choreography that you know uh, it it gets interrupted if it becomes intellectual. Um, so that's that's sort of the best the best possible world I think. Mm -hmm. And then more more recently, I find Jennifer and I actually to kind of. Um, make sure and to break our groove, we actually have very explicit conscious conversations more than we did like in the middle 10 years of making films together. Mm -hmm. we, we, we make ourselves say it more with words, which can be a good, a, a good exercise, I think. Um, I think uh, the, the most fruitful sort of relationships for me are the ones where we are talking all the way through. The process is so long sometimes that um, 
you have to embrace the changes that the situation offers. And I find that there are very, there are a lot of intellectual conversations that happen midway because we are having to deal with this curve um, in the narrative that we didn't expect. And, and so it requires sort of stepping back and thinking, okay, what is this? What are we doing in the first place? Um, to really get at those answers as to how to deal with um, all those unknowns that are thrown at you. Um, so I, I, yeah, I love those, those midway conversations because I think they're also very fruitful because they actually take into account different, you know, as opposed to the ones that happened before you go out to shoot the first shot, these are taking into account what we now know. And it's also a nice um, advantage to working on a long form documentary that takes one or three years to shoot is, is that progression of, of how you learn and, and can build on um, what's already happened. Mm. So, but yeah, there's a, there's a very, it's very varied um, in terms of those relationships and how those conversations happen. Yeah. Do you want to show a clip of long time running and we will, we'll talk over it, but um, to show and talk about sort of different kinds of visual language in, in documentary. Sure. All right. <laughs> I was seventh camera on this, by the way. And I was, <laughs> as you said, way back in the bleacher. It was really, so that was one of the moments that was really amazing for me is to be present for this really communal, beautiful thing. So um, thank you for that. I'm just joking about the, <laughs> the intimidating I, time I had working with you and Jennifer. <laughs> but it was likewise, amazing. likewise. <laughs> um, I think at one point we had. Uh, I think there may be 32 feeds or something mm -hmm. on that. Um, so I hope everyone can see this and it's, it's MOS of course, but um, as, as I was thinking, Iris, you know, of, of um, things to show or moments I'm kind of most proud of as a, as a cinematographer, it's not always the, the visual fireworks, the, you know, the kind of eye candy, um, uh, explosive uh, visuals. Sometimes it's a much more intimate, like real life moment where I was just feeling privileged to be there. Usually it's a human moment. This is Gore Downey getting ready backstage as he's done, you know, as he had done so many thousands of times through a career of, of music um, for his last concert. And that's just Verite handheld, just me and him and, and his, um, uh, it's actually the tour manager. Um, and then, you know, in documentary, sometimes there's that sit down talking head interview that we cut to there for a sec that can be more, I think, kind of the subjects, um, unconscious often it goes to voiceover but often the face is more expressive as well if you're showing it sync um and uh it's hard like everyone always says oh i'd love to shoot verite all the time but i think i think subjects can be more contemplative if you can create um uh, a really welcoming environment for them in a sit-down interview um, mm -hmm. Uh, even though visually it's not the most cinematically dynamic and interesting, but it's kind of part of our part of our lexicon, I guess, and the semantics of documentary. So we often go there. Some people ignore it altogether. There's such a wide range of practice. Um, and then for contrast, the intimacy of Gord backstage. We cut away a few times here to outside, but we're leading up, you know, from very quiet um, to that kind of moment of the Thunderdome in the rock concert. So the scale goes from very small to very large and very small. The intimacy of one camera, I think, is, is crucial. And then very large, obviously, you know, you want as many angles and and showing the scale as you can for a, a live event uh, so we deployed a number of cameras around the 
around the concert hall. Was there anything that you were thinking about differently in terms of the Verite work? Um, oh, sorry, were you going to bring the volume up? Uh, no, I'm, I'm okay. not sure. I, I'm not sure you always can. I did an educational one of these, and the guy who was a real expert said it's like 50 50 sometimes the, the, the volume works and goes through the Zoom, and oh, okay. sometimes it doesn't. But anyway. I was hearing a little bit, so I wasn't sure if you were trying to. Oh, all right. Um, no, I could have then. But. Was there anything differently? Were you thinking any differently about how you captured the Verte moments for this film as opposed to other ones that you? made which aesthetically are i think are quite different but was there anything you felt you stepped out of in terms of your own practice or, or was it mostly instinctual still i i'd like to hope that every scene that you shoot is entirely instinctual and unique to that to that film and to that scene um so that if it's a very quiet intimate moment you're probably you're going to want to be as as quiet yourself uh, with the with the camera and and with your presence um and not have a heavy, heavy hand and not not insert yourself and and try and disrupt the the intimacy of that scene as little as possible um and really just just feel it i don't know do you think lots of of documentary cinematographers are like you and I are both kind of shy and probably better at listening than, you know, giving Zoom presentations um, or addressing large numbers of people. Do you think that's like a, a job, you know, personality requirement for the job is to is to be that kind of listening, listening with your with your eyes sometimes, but um, also being aware of the dynamic and the mood in the in the moment. I definitely do, and I think I think that informs our path too, and and what people um, see in our work that they maybe want from us. And and other people have different paths because they have different strengths. And um, you know, I've worked with different camera people, um, um, you know, as second cameras or co co cameras operators. And it's interesting how how those strengths can really and weaknesses can can really complement each other and. When you can find the proper, um, even within each other, uh, between each other, as well as with the dynamic um, between you and the subject, um, there's such a balance. And I've, I've found that with just, for instance, the one time that I've had this really great relationship working with um, a co-shooter was with Nelson Walker on uh, Making a Murderer, which is, was an exclusively two-camera shoot. Um, and the directors knew both of us before they brought us together. Um, one of them having gone to school with them, I think, with, with him, and knew that his strengths were more in, in um, coordinating verite situations, and, and that's where his experience lied. And, and mine was a lot having to do with like sit down interviews and setting up something more methodical. And um, the fact that we could complement our strengths that way was, was a really nice thing to experience for me. Um, but um, I sort of went on a tangent there, and I don't remember what your initial question was. But yeah, I'm not sure if it, if, if it was a question, but maybe coming out of that idea of the 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 one camera versus two, mm -hmm. um, or the the intimacy of of being as small as you can as a presence in a very intimate moment. Um, obviously, two cameras. You know, I I almost always. Uh, record my own sound just mm -hmm. that that started years ago out of sort of financial necessity of not mm -hmm. having the budget to bring another person and then that's kind of developed into into part of you know how i love to work and take into account the whole oral environment as well and i'm sure that informs my my shooting um uh, is is knowing that i'm responsible for for the whole package picture and sound um, and and trying to kind of be reactive to those those moments as well. But the w one versus two camera w w did parts because murder is so great, and and um, uh, the two cameras in that to me kind of um, reflects the you don't always know what's going on. You don't you know there's multiple points of view, so it's it, you can see how philosophically it would motivate multi-camera even in in the moment but for you as a 
as a cinematographer, do you mm -hmm. prefer to work alone? Um, and But that worked for that? Or do you often work with a second camera or even a second angle when you're when you're setting them, setting up a setup for an interview or something? No, that's exactly it. I do like, I prefer the singular days of, of just working with one camera and to be in that space and negotiating all of the anticipating and, uh, and feeling that's, that's necessary to, to film the moment that, um, in the way that it deserves, I think. Um, that happened to have worked for that situation. There are situations where you just need that other angle. It's, it is very much about reactions, let's say in those very tender moments or, or even having two sizes in interview moments. I don't tend to, to push for the other angle. And in fact, I try to push for the singular angle. I just me, feel like that too. dynamic yeah. is, it, that it is more conducive to the feeling of listening. Um, to answer your initial question, I do think um, you and I are both um, people who like to sort of observe and I think that's reflected sometimes in in our work, and I, I think it's helpful for the films that I tend to work on. Um, but um, so yeah, I find uh, it distracting to to have you know to switch the gaze from from one angle to the other when listening is more about sitting and um, less manipulation. I think um, unless it's unless there's something to speak about seeing something from a different angle. I think, I think then it's, um, then it's kind of interesting to switch it up. But I find a lot of the time that other angle maybe is used as a crutch for editing. And so I try to resist the tendency to do that unless there's a very good reason for it aesthetically. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're just old and like, that's a newer thing. Every interview has to have the second lock off side angle or something. Um, kind of stemming out of this, Matt Irwin has a question about how do you reconcile the balance between creating a visual style and simply getting the story or shot? And that can be with regard to camera lens shots or, or otherwise. Do you find that it's hand in hand? You know, that's it. Um, you, you have to get the shot a lot of times. You can't miss it. And so you, you can't be afraid of imperfection, right? I mean, I, I think uh, on the extreme and very stylized drama sets, you can rehearse and rehearse and set up and prep and everything in, you know, to really be able to execute a singular vision in a way that you just can't in, in verite. And so you you have to kind of release yourself um, from from wanting to control things because sometimes that something will just start happening and you got to pick up the camera and run and do it and you may not have the right stop you may not have you know it's the the buttons where you want them the lights sure isn't always great mm -hmm. and tough shit right you just you just got to get it as best you can at the same time when you can get it even if it's not you know wouldn't be part of your like you know uh, reel for commercials or something there there's a kind of perfection when you get it i mean you're you're all experiencing this moment for the first time um and and sometimes it just kind of sings like you get this sort of uh ecstasy this magic when the camera's rolling and you just know it's in the movie you know that it's a moment and especially if you say holy shit, the light worked out and I love this frame, um, you know, and the opposite can happen sometimes too, but there's, there's always a balance for me, I think of, yeah, I'm, I'm getting it at minimum, um, but sometimes it, it sings. And when it sings, obviously that, that's a highlight. But I think that sometimes the truth of the shot in context of whatever you're shooting becomes the style Anyway, I mean, your style can be something that you preconceive, or it could be a lot of the time, as it happens with me, it, it's something that you discover. And just to embrace whatever that moment gives you, I don't think that's ever counter to um, to what it's about. If if you're following your instincts, if you have everything you need, you know, there are a lot of shots that have appeared in films that I would have thought were, were more mistakes. Um, yeah. But there's a virtue to to how they, you know, not 
being ready for it is is part of is part of the truth of that moment. And I think that lends itself to feeling feeling real. Um, and I don't know. I, I think. I mean, there's so much. There's so many ways to talk about this. I don't think I answered Matt's question, but um, what's but, what's you know. what's your go-to kit if you have one, or do you spread it around different so, cameras? What do you um, pack in these I, days? Yeah, I've realized. Um, so, just a little bit of history with the documentary work that I've done. Um, I had worked with the C300 for for three years when it was. The thing, and I loved it, and and there are great things about that camera. Um, but when the, I think I had this one shoot call. Um, the first film that I used this FS7 on was um, this river, which takes place on a motorboat, and that was at the, at a time when the NFB needed um, to acquire in 4K, where they were starting to want to do that. So that was the camera to do that at the time. Um, for various reasons, that's become my go-to. And after a couple of years, I decided to buy one. So I have an FS7 Mark II um, with a Metabones speed booster, and I use the Canon EF Bills lenses. Um, my go-to for a long time was the 24 to 105, which I know in you know for our audience and in this land, CSC land, and, and I like that's not. <laughs> That is not the choice lens. I, when so I that's that, that that's an L series stills glass, right? Yeah, L I mean, this stills is glass. not the sharpest, you know, especially on the wide. Um, it's a little dark on the on the long end, but it ha nothing has has come close to providing that range that I need and the weight and the fact that I have to use a speed uh, have to use an adapter to fit on the camera. It means I get the extra stop from the speed booster. Um, and aside from, from all that and, and how I've developed my kit, um, to be very specific to my needs, it, it's more about the way I pack it, I think, to be very familiar. I don't have to wonder whether anything is missing. If I see any holes, any air in the case, I know that there's a piece missing. So it's, um, it just becomes this something to rely on amongst all of the other variables that that can be thrown at you while you're shooting a documentary. Um, that's the one comfort <laughs> that I have is that my gear will always be the same. I can trust it. I don't have to test it anymore. It saves me a lot of time prepping uh, when I rent it. Um, even though I love renting, I love uh, having that relationship with equipment houses, learning new things, having conversations. Um, it's just for what I do and as mobile as I've had to be, that's work the best for me yeah did you ever shoot film so yeah, yeah so i started um when i was in film school i went to new york and it was just in the middle where we were we started learning on film but yeah. digital was starting to come in where uh non linear editing was was becoming a thing and so we were practicing on some avids by the end of the four years yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um how about you? You have a very different um, go-to package, I think. Well, it kind of, um, the first uh, time that I uh, worked with Ed Bertinsky, the stills photographer, super high resolution, you know, he's up to 100 megapixel back on, he just actually switched from Hasselblad to Phase as a large format art stills photographer and all about printing big and super high resolution. And when we were kind of collaborating on film projects, um, there was a lot of talk about, should we be trying to match his resolution mm -hmm. uh, or should we not? Should we just stay away, um, you know, and, and have the video look very different and we'll animate, you know, over his stills and, and uh, we, th we thought we wanted to do more than that and try and sort of extend the narratives and the ideas of scale that he was exploring in a still into time-based, into, into documentary film. Um, so that was um, uh, Watermark, and they had just started making the epic after the red one. Mm -hmm. So we had one of the first, you know, sort of hand-assembled, epic prototypes and 
I, I, I was ready, uh, you know, at the time, actually I made a little, a little slideshow. I, I was ready for a challenge cause I had used, um, uh, let me see if I can get this to fire up here. Um, where did that one go? Can't find it. Um, I was ready to try and embrace a new workflow because I had worked on um, uh, a whole bunch of different cameras through the years. Like that's an that's an old Airy film camera back in the days of of uh, SD video. You just you know anytime you were shooting video, Betacam, SP, Hi8, even you'd just kind of plug your nose. Um, and, uh, oh, I see I'm on the wrong, um, oh, that's too bad. It's not, uh, letting me advance through somehow. Oh, there, now it is. Um, uh, you just plug your nose when you're shooting SD video. So shooting actual film at the time, even on super low budget was like fantastic because you could, it could look like, um, you know, movies looked like. Uh, and what that sort of look of reality beyond just information and news and stuff was. Um, and then obviously this kind of sort of shape of camera was the big workhorse. I don't know if it was the same for you, but I had a, I had a DV cam ENG style camera, you know, a uh, single operator <clears throat> camera. And I had a beta cam before that DV cam. And then the HD cam was the best of them. It was a great camera, fantastic zoom multiplier. You know, you'd get 16 times on the zoom at least, uh, which is amazing for coverage. Um, <clears throat> this is on a discovery shoot where they were wanting and a doubler when you want it. What's that? And a doubler when you want it. And a doubler even, you know, yeah, and, and, and so that. that, that was my completely transparent workflow handheld. It didn't have to think about it. Right. I, I did that for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years and easy to handhold and tough in any situation. Um, uh, you know, you could have whatever it was, a if you didn't throw too much contrast at a lot of those cameras, they were actually really pretty good mm -hmm. and could be cinematic. Uh, if you did throw too much contrast at them, you'd kind of be in trouble. Like probably I was in that setup, something like that. Fine. You know, you mm -hmm. couldn't tell the difference a lot, especially in HD. And then the Epic, you know, just completely different big chip. Uh, I think I was, I, I risked like breaking the, the zoom ring on zooms that I had because I kept wanting it to go farther as I tried to, you know, shoot Verite with it. This is an early, super inelegant, I don't think I ever used this, but trying to turn it into a single operator Verite camera with audio too, um, you know, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't think I ever actually did that. I was ready for like, you know, um, what that, new kind of way of working would bring and also kind of more matching the resolution of Bertinsky's um, photographs. And so we, yeah, we got it for watermark and there were a lot of growing pains in the end. I mean, I sort of made it work and it's a great camera. Obviously it takes fantastic pictures, but as a, as a Verite camera, it had a lot of drawbacks, you know, like that's not an ideal set up if you have time you know great mm -hmm. it's it's much more it's, it's much more suited to that but it's not like there's a camera department lovingly swarming over it you know changing the nd filters in front of the lens and stuff uh um or worrying about your sound um uh so challenges um but kind of I don't know. A lot of what we do is finding a way to make it work. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have the camera department there when you're in the field or the rental house or the, that piece of gear that you left at home. <clears throat> um, and you can't always, you know, you have to adapt. That was the other thing about the Epic is that uh, that's tab fear show on the left. Who's the inventor of the movie. And he had had these early uh, drones. Look at that, like single, 
main rotor drone was the only drone that could carry the Epic as a payload. So um, he was bored of shooting car commercials and hadn't become rich and famous yet with the movie. So he actually came with us to China and some other shoots and, and uh, we'd swap out Ed's Hasselblad for the Epic to get various uh, drone shots. Um, Drones weren't so ubiquitous then at all, but, where we were on a film about water, we needed needed that perspective. We needed to get away from things. And then sometimes you're just like, <clears throat> the epic would just chew batteries and media. And in the end, uh, it got to be, you know, you couldn't use it on those days when you have to just shoot out of a knapsack all day. So I C300 for me too was the, the fantastic addition. Um, and I just had all my lenses, um, flanged at EF so they could migrate across all the cameras um, and that became easier and then you're traveling with like absurd amounts of gear so it doesn't work for lots of productions but um, for some of them and then now um, the, the answer for me these days is the Amira and it's uh, so for long time running and for Anthropocene you know the basic setup is Amira with um, I don't use this wide. This is an airy, lightweight zoom. I don't use that as much anymore, uh, sometimes for wides, but there's a, the Canon 17 to 120. Um, you know, it's the it's the uh, the old Alexa chip, um, and so it's that look that everyone knows and loves, but with, uh, with that zoom, and it's just made for a single operator. So it's heavy, um, mm-hmm. but... You, you know, you can make it work working alone and single system sound, um, all those happy things. Uh, you can you can mostly work all day out of an app sack. And yeah, you can mm-hmm. obviously any lenses you want. Oh, there's the Epic we put on the front of a train actually uh, uh, for oh. the, the Anthropocene. I love that shot. The The... You know, the Swiss, I always stereotype as being super precise, but they obviously didn't go back and check my mathematics report card from high school because they actually let me strap a thing to the front of their train that went 200 kilometers an hour. And I was never in danger of being an engineer. But anyway, it worked. I I was wondering whether that shot was achieved in camera with the rotation. And I see now that um, that was done in post, I guess. Oh yeah, the shot. Um, if people haven't uh, seen it, the we go along the tracks, and it's the longest uh, rail tunnel in the world. Um, is what we're capturing just from the front of the train, and uh, um, at one point, you know, it becomes just line and form and abstraction. Like there's lights coming at you, and it sort of ceases to be what it is, and uh, um, it actually turns upside down the whole thing. And yeah, we the the train engineer wanted to show off all of his fancy new train stuff but he he couldn't actually make it flip upside down so we had to do that in post (laughs) i love it yeah um there's a question from josh asking how we tackle the observer's presence um when documenting a subject and whether we think it's truly impossible truly possible to be unobtrusive um and I think I, I can sort of answer that with a, with a clip and sort of talking about perspective a little bit. Um, and I think maybe I'll try. Um, so I worked on a film. We didn't really introduce ourselves and what kind of work we do. I, I'm maybe there's some, there's some time for that in a bit. But I'm just going to jump in to say that I worked on a film called A Better Man, um, which is about the restorative restorative justice as it pertains to domestic abuse and what it looks like when you speak to somebody who, you know, 20 years ago, um, abu- you know, physically, mentally, sexually abused you when you, um, when you were teenagers in that relationship. And it, it sort of deconstructs or tries to deconstruct what that's really about and, and what the restorative justice um, process looks like. So the, the film is very much about uh, a lot of conversations between the main character, Atia, and um, people in her life at the time talking about um, just rehashing what had, what had happened. And I just have a clip where she's speaking with the boyfriend that she had after the abusive one, um, or the, 
the one who used violence. And I can't do the film justice. It's hard to take things out of context like this, but so hopefully people can, can check these films out on their own. But um, this is when they go for a walk. And I get full screen here. And so there are all these conversations that, that go on be before you start filming about what the film's about and why you're making it in the first place. And I sort of I try to have as many as I can and, and bank that information to have in the back of my head because when I'm filming a Verite moment, I can't be too conscious of it, but, but I can refer to, to those themes and all those, um, all those intentions, I guess. And I suppose I wouldn't have been able to articulate this at the time, but after the film is finished, um, I read an article about how the camera work in, in the film actually modeled active listening, which, which embodies the, the very theme of the film and the very purpose of it is to, is to listen and to have a voice. And so I feel like the style of the way I, I moved with these, um, with these subjects was just to, to hold a little bit longer and to wait until they could hear the other one and receive information and, and, and see it land and, and to also focus on somebody who was speaking and not try to manipulate the, the gaze too much. And to answer that other question, you know, so, so you kind of, um, so you kind of become the subject of a film in a way. And the way that you feel like you, you can make decisions about moving and panning back and forth or not, um, I feel like somehow you can embody the theme, if that makes sense. And so when I talked to Atia afterwards, um, she said that they really truly forgot about my presence. And I think that partly has to do with um, just feeling out the moment and letting letting them get ahead of me during the walk. I'm not always in their face and I'm not actually directly in front of them. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm getting a different kind of intimate moment where I'm letting the conversation actually happen privately between two people and, and just, and not sort of adhering to, I guess the convention of, of trying to get as much as possible and just being a feeling human being in this moment has, has really helped the film to, somehow um, speak to the very purpose of why, <laughs> why it, was, it was made and, and to the themes themselves. I think that's so important, you know, to Josh's point, you can never eliminate yourself. You're there with this, this piece of technology that's quite intrusive. Um, and, and the best you can do, the most successful I think you can be is to, is to have them forget about you as much as possible. And that depends a lot on the subject, you know, like I'm a terrible subject. I'm always aware when there's a camera on me. Some people are just better about being themselves um, and, and all the shades in between. So, I mean, part of the job is almost, yeah, that kind of psychological part where you, you, you try and put the person at ease so you're hopefully not a threat. Um, sometimes you just wear them down. Sometimes it's how many hours can you spend of stuff that isn't for all the marbles, right? That isn't the most important scene. So they get used to it. They, um, you know, that movie American Factory, I don't know if you saw it, like how many thousands of hours of footage over how many years, like the camera just became part of the landscape for those subjects. And then they kind of revealed themselves. Um, sometimes probably in ways that, that they didn't want. I mean, the whole ethics of engagement mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of the stuff that, that you and I do, you know, we would never want people to say something that, that they would later regret was part of a movie. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, but you want them to be as authentic in the moment as, as they possibly can be. And that's part of your job is, 
is not being threatening and trying to eliminate as many of the trappings of a film shoot. You know, I did this one co-production. Um, we went to Mexico and it was a French, you know, and so there had, there had to be like a number, like a bigger crew and we descended on this village and I just, I was like, this is never going to work. We're 12 people mm-hmm. with all of this gear. And it's like, no, like, you know, that's, that's why sometimes I just love to work alone like that, mm-hmm. that that's the, and sometimes when Jen and I are doing stuff because we're married, you know, if it's, if it's whatever, there's something disarming about that, anything you can do to, to disarm. And art had a question about, you know, how do you deal with lights um, right. uh, in those, in those verite moments, camera placement. I um, mean, for, I just mentioned something about, yeah. about that unobtrusive, unobtrusiveness. Um, I think just you need to be the person that the subjects want you to be, <laughs> or, or you, you become the person that the subject needs you to be, which is, whatever that is, somebody who is, is along with them for the ride or hangs back, or in this case, they just needed a listener and not somebody who moved around too much. But the other thing that made this a very flexible shoot in terms of just letting it happen for hours on end and just following the action um, was to have a sound person. Um, we had Jason Hopfner, who was very good at wiring people. Um, so not relying on the boom, which is a, another presence in itself, right? The camera is one thing, but the boom is really another because it hovers over your head. And I think a, a big part of that comfort level in that moment was, was that he could also hang much further back than I did and to not exert his own presence in that too. Um, anyway, yes. Yeah, I, I, like, I'll often do a very on-the-fly calculus um, because sometimes you get to have a deeper relationship and you're with a subject for over an extended period of time. That's always the best, but sometimes you're just arriving at somebody's house, you know, you got a couple hours. Um, and sure, I, I could make a better shot if I go and set up a bunch of lights, every light I brought in the car, um, if I, you know, wire the place up. But sometimes just the fact of all that stuff, I can tell if the person's already kind of, you know, not warming to this whole experience. And sometimes just the time to do that, Mm -hmm. it becomes less of an authentic exchange and more of a film shoot. And so you're just not going to get probably that subject's best self. So sometimes I will, I'll make a quick decision to use almost all available light Mm -hmm. um, and just be as fast as possible and get shooting as quickly as possible, even at the expense of some of the production values. Um, because the scene I figure, and I hope I'm right, will be better um, with the truth and authenticity of a better experience than with the details of, mm-hmm. of you know, the perfect, perfectly composed shot for the, yeah. you know, for the camera reel. I agree, and I, I think, well, that's always a mode of working that I, I really appreciate, and I, tr- I try to remember that. There's always this balance of, like, it was a Kleenex box in the background, and do you interrupt, <laughs> you know, you're, you're constantly balancing all these, all these needs. And, and is, is that actually going to deter from what this person is saying? And, and a lot of the times I find that it does. And I, I try to spend the time to think about all of these things at once, which is, which is really challenging, in, you know, the subject's needs, because the more you talk about the things around them and ask them to, to adjust themselves, the more they do feel like it's, it's a film shoot. And, and I think I've been in a situation where, I've been interviewed and I on camera and I would never do this again because I hate it. But but you you become so aware of everything around you, everything that becomes part of the conversation between you and the director about okay, what about this? And um, they're all detrimental, I think, to to the moment. But also, you also have to think about which is more detrimental: the <laughs> the detail or or the the dynamic. Have, have, have you ever missed it? Owen has a question. Did, <laughs> did you ever? I sure have. Boy, those lessons are hard. I hard have. One. I, I mean. <laughs> I try to block them out. Um, of course it happens. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have an example to really cite at the moment. And maybe, maybe if I thought about it. How about you? I mean, wh- when you think of, of how vulnerable 
you've been especially traveling. I mean, I think of those times where you'd put your heart and your blood and sweat and tears into that suitcase full of hundred foot daylight reels in Morocco or India or somewhere. And like, it could all be nothing, right? Or it could all get zapped somehow. Um, and you don't know till you come back to Toronto to the, like all of, I'm, I'm lucky I've never had, you know, that happen. Um, uh, I did record over a DV cam tape once and I just, you know, it's a budget thing. You, you, independent low budget filmmaker and you're recycling tapes and I had mislabeled one and it was a only copy raw interview. Um, I won't say who or what. And I had made a, a VHS copy with time code window burn. And yes. that had to be needless to say that scene got sort of reimagined and it had, it had a very grainy stylized look to it after you pushed in on the VHS past the time code burn in uh, and also cut away to lots of more abstract visual language. That was a fuck up that I, I vowed I would never try and recycle something like that again. So some of those lessons are hard earned. I think to get you into the state, you know, knock on wood, that you, you kind of have a sense of your settings and your buttons and whether you're recording or not, I'll still mess it up sometimes if I'm toggling quick, like record, stop, record, stop. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, I'll realize, oh, wow, I'm at a sync. I just missed that one. You know, hopefully you can say, oh, do you mind just putting yeah. your hand there again? It's <laughs> not, you know, you can't say, do you guys mind breaking up again or whatever, you know, right. you, you, you can't miss those ones basically. But yeah. um, I missed moments because, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Um, because sometimes I feel that the subjects need me to put the camera down yeah. just, just to have a break and just to, to just renew some trust and, and to just look somebody in the eye as, as opposed to through a lens once in a while. And I'll sort of create that reprieve, but um, sometimes that's actually a cue for a lot of people to have the more genuine moments and to, to do actually what we were waiting for the whole time. So I, I find that that happens a lot and, and you just, you can't stop listening and watching to see whether somebody's going to turn themselves back on or, or whether this is actually the moment where they're more relaxed. Um, so I know that that's, that happens a lot too. And, so when, you, and when you cut. During it's so hard. I know. <laughs> Thanks very much. That was great. Great interview. And then like with the relief of it's over, they'll actually, say the gold so yes the whole premise that's, of the film is right there yes it's a tough one yep. um toxic beauty yeah different kinds of of visual language because we've been talking a lot about verite but mm -hmm. um i mean one of the things probably we both love about docs is that there's this huge range of what goes into a doc um and it's not like yeah it can be grounded in in that sort of journalistic truth um that immediacy of of reporting you know like a, a moment and an exchange but it can also be very stylized very um uh interpretive very associative visually and and that obviously is is wonderfully liberating too as a as the camera person mm -hmm. and i think that's a more recent film um that I made with Phyllis Ellis, who I've worked with a number of times. And that film being about the toxins in our everyday personal care products, there was an invisible threat. There's an invisible enemy that was on a molecular level. And how do you bring that to, how do you talk about that? Um, the substances that are, that are harming people. And um, of course, when you have room to do this is, is at the, the end of, all of your interviews and, and most of the production. And, and also usually when um, funds are <laughs> a little bit more scarce, you, you're sort of at the end of that as well. And so Phyllis and I just decided to experiment with, with some products and just to see what, um, I'll just share this here. to see how we could interpret this maybe abstractly. And me, it meant getting on a, a macro level a lot of the time, but 
it also meant let's let's create something a little bit absurd and play and really play around with these substances so one of um one of the culprits of this film uh, is talcum powder. And so we were just, we were just in her home. I had this black cloth and we just, I just had one LED up backlighting, backlighting this. And we just decided to throw some tal talcum powder around and that became, it's extremely fun, but also it became a, sort of a through line to, to the rest of the story, as well as these other, um, I just got to find them, these product shots of just getting into liquids and um, just really seeing these substances that we take for granted every day and, and seeing them in this sort of ridiculous light and seeing amounts of them that we would never see because actually this is about a cumulative process over our lives and, and what those effects are on our bodies. Um, so when you compound that and visualize that, um, it we found that that was a, a nice compliment to sometimes a very literal, literal one too, to what, um, to what people were talking about in their interviews and all the information we're getting. But um, let me just find this other one here. Yeah. Using all those layers in, in documentary where you can mm -hmm. have on-screen text and you can often have voiceover, um, uh, you know, that, that concept of, of, B role, um, yeah. which, which, I mean, yeah, Jennifer hates that term B roll because yeah. it, it sort of relegates it to a marginal value. Um, the B roll can be the whole point of it, um, and can be evocative and artistic in and of itself and should be front and center in a visual medium. Um, uh, but also like that, that scene, the fact that you're slow-mo, um, you know, it's going to make you think about what the voiceover is saying more, the fact that there's a level of abstraction, that it's not literal, that it's not on the nose. Uh, mm -hmm. It's kind of more contemplative, I think. And it slows something down and, and lets you examine something that you never really pay attention to. And so um, just taking things apart and just having a better look at them is, is exactly what the purpose of the film was as well. So I think it's hard to articulate this until you actually get in there and, and experiment a little bit um, visually. And I think that's very much part of the process for me a lot of the time is, is, is discovering by doing. Um, So these are all product shots that, these are all substances that we filmed and the editor created a montage for, but um, it also allows you to, to not rely on stock footage so much. I think I have this resistance to, to that and to, to always want to create footage that it fits within the language that we've already established that we've worked so hard to, to create. And, it's necessary to go to archival, of course, but sometimes when, when you're just going to product shots, it, it doesn't, it just feels so much more cobbled together. And I, I prefer to have as much um, creative control, I guess, as, as possible. And so this, it was nice that we could do that in this film and have that balance. Yeah, there's there's a visual coherence that we're always striving for, and even something you know where where you're going from um, looks like more talking head, uh, you know, uh, more established prescribed uh, documentary visual language to that level of abstraction um, in the in the macro photography, but it's all you, and I think it makes it part of the part of the same story much more than cutting to some archival source or generic, you know, uh, certainly in, in, because the last few, uh, that I've worked on in the sort of environmental space, like Anthropocene and, and Watermark, um, there's a trope in environmental films, um, of finding, yeah, the, the sunset with the smokestacks, that's a beautiful shot, but the, 
a lot of them are so generic that you just kind of glaze over. They're kind of corporate. Um, mm -hmm. and, and anything that can be a little bit different um, or personal or just make you, um, you know, that has a different rhythm that might make you pay attention. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that film, I could do a clip actually, but in, in that film, we, um, uh, you know, we, we used a lot of abstraction and a lot of just kind of line and form and, and the images about itself in some way. Um, uh, as much as it's about something. So there's no voiceover behind this necessarily. Um, it's, it's just a more contemplative moment. Well, there's a text, I guess, but um, that, that hopefully um, it's a little different than some documentary that's very polemic, that's going to bombard you with information and facts and figures. This is meant to leave you uh, in a sort of state where you can have a dialogue with those images so your own brain and questions and thoughts are much more active than you know a lot of times we're passive we're letting things wash over us um but this is using kind of that non-narrative imagery mm -hmm. to to make it hopefully more visceral and emotional an experience um uh, very much being struck by by imagery um, and stepping out of what we normally like our stepping out of our normal perspective of this and and being in awe of scale I think that that's the the sense that I get when I watch your films and that's just that's that's the most impactful right is those shots where you just see how massive something is yeah um Um, but that's a great gift. Like that film, holy shit. So fantastic for me to have, um, the philosophy among my collaborators with Bert, Ed Bertinsky and, and Jennifer and everyone agreeing that it's going to be visuals first. The visuals are going to be freighted with the storytelling, um, and any other kind of information is going to be just enough to unlock the visuals. So it's not just a wank and arbitrary, but you're given hopefully enough context. I mean, how often do you get that gift as the cinematographer and that responsibility? Um, that, that's, that's fantastic. And then the resources to be able to do it and, and to be able to once in a while have the, the helicopter and the, you know, the, the toys when you need them um, to be able to not feel like you're, you're missing out um, and not not doing justice to the scale of what that is. So, I mean, that's kind of one one end, and not a lot of intimate human moments at all in that. Right? In a way, they do punctuate through. There's little. There's moments of workers in huge industrial areas, but they're the exception rather than the rule. It's it's um it's the opposite of that kind of more intimate human geography mapping with cinematography and something like a better man. Um, uh, but hopefully a place for all of that wide yeah. range in the gamut of, of filmmaking. Yes. And do you got a vector? There's a question from Arthur. That's a good one. Have you ever rolled on something or someone when you were pretending not to? What's fair game? Trust is obviously important to maintain. Holy shit! What a can of worms. Um, uh, in terms of of ethics and how important the ethics of wielding the power of the camera in a yeah in with anyone who's vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Well, I've definitely been in a situation where um, I was asked to, to shoot something. And a lot of the time, yes, you do. And sometimes you have to in order to, to not encourage ruining the shot of, <laughs> of somebody and, and trying to get that candidness of just 
hoping that somebody doesn't look at the camera. But yes, very directly, I've been asked to to shoot something where, um, in a clandestine way, where um, I I ultimately trust that the director is going to um, have the considerations and the the proper consent um, after the fact to to use this footage and and that the editing process can have like that's where those decisions can be made and and that hasn't always happened and i've felt really mortified and um i'm not proud of those moments where i feel like i'm part of a moment that has has felt made somebody feel exploited um so that's happened very directly um and i won't name what that moment was but um yeah, when you're filming on the street too, when you're shooting these visuals, cityscapes, whatever it is, um, that is going to happen. And you you can do your best to, to acquire consent in the moment or after the moment. Um, what's nice is that I, I get to work on uh, a show called Kim's Convenience. And I do what's called the transition shots in between all the studio scenes that, that occur in that it's a half hour comedy. Um, and that gives me a lot of pleasure because it is the documentary shooting that I'm used to in that sort of getting B-roll and getting the flavor of a city and, you know, thinking about perspective and the sort of insider view of Toronto. Um, so I'm thinking about all the neighborhoods and, and placing myself there and what would, what would just a regular Torontonian see if they looked around them and what is the real, the real flavor of this neighborhood. And, the beauty of that is we go out with a big crew. It's not a real documentary, but we go out with a big crew where everybody's looking at my monitor. And once I cut on a, on a minute shot or whatever, five people disperse and, and go and chase people down for releases. And if we don't have the consent, we make a note of that. Um, so that's, that's an instance where it's very stringent and we're, we're very careful about it. And I, I'm really comfortable in that space. Having said that, there is this moment that has really informed me and, and reminded me of this, the importance of this consent and the responsibility that we have in pointing a camera, which is sometimes a weapon to people, right? I, it's um, this moment where I was in Kensington Market a couple of years ago, and we're shooting at night, and I was just shooting a scene with these this group of young people who were just hanging out outside of this bar at night, and we had permission to shoot them, but I also saw this woman rolling, um, walking towards us, sort of in the background. And I really wanted to point a camera at her because she was, um, she was one of the bottle people who go around the city collecting bottles. I just love that there's this system that we have of, um, of allowing people to do this. I found it really, I find them really endearing. And I really wanted to, to just film her cart or, or part of her, even if not her face. And I just stopped myself at the last moment. I almost hit the button, but I stopped myself. And she kind of, you know, looked at me sort of doubtingly as she was walking away. But we continued to, to shoot over the next 45 minutes. And we were just about to wrap up and she came running towards us and she was holding this piece of paper and i walked up to her and i said what what is i think you know it was a little bit of a weird moment but i just asked her what what it was and she wasn't speaking english and she gave me this piece of paper and it said i'm sorry but you may have filmed me a little while ago on the street i need to tell you that i cannot be filmed please and thank you and she was sort of waving her arms around and I, I just tried my Cantonese with her and I said, I, I wasn't filming you. I know, I remember this. I promise you, I did not roll and I, I did not film you at all. And she was, she was actually in tears because she was very concerned. And, um, and I, I was just so relieved that that happened to be one of those moments where um, I leaned on, on that side of that decision. And, and that doesn't always happen, but it was a real reminder of how important that is to, to just have a responsibility for where we point the camera. We are walking into communities that are, sometimes they're ours, sometimes they're not. They're in different countries. And I, I, like, I prefer to think about what rights we have to, to be taking visuals from this community and, 
and how they're going to be used. And a lot of the times it's, it's not worth it. Um, a lot of the times, a lot of time it is, <laughs> but, but so that's, that's been my experience with that. And that's, that's how I try to balance it. But what a, what a, yeah, what a great story. And, and um, I mean, for me, that, that kind of points to an answer to the question of, of a very individual expression of morality that's going to be different for every person. I mean, every shooter um, uh, and probably every situation, you know, I'm, I'm a terrible liar. And even though I, I hate like, you know, large evil corporations or, you know, there's people out there who, who I think in terms of intentionality, I could justify lying to and grabbing stuff without their permission. And, you know, as a, a the ends justifying the means, mm-hmm. I, I'm terrible at that stuff because I'm, uh, I, I just not, I can't keep the poker face or, or give away the fact that I'm lying. So I always prefer to be in a situation of, of fully um, uh, uh, having, you know, said that what I'm doing there with that camera is is what I'm doing. I'm not lying to get access. A lot of times, you know, Anthropocene, we're in these huge coal mines in Germany. It mm-hmm. takes half a year to get in there. Um, um, and it's it's tempting to say, oh, we're about something else. But actually, you know, it, it kind of doesn't work in the end if you're if you're trying to have a have a sort of moral agenda in, in your film, um, then it, it doesn't help to be on the wrong side of those, of those ethics. But for me, it's all about the intentionality. I've certainly left the camera rolling at the end of an interview and caught that thing sometimes where the person, you know, you say it's over or say, well, that was great. Um, uh, but then I wouldn't use it unless you know, it's sort of okay. And you mm-hmm. can tell the person then knew. And a lot of times it, I'll just, I'll put the cans back on and the person gets back into it kind of thing. And I've, I've caught things like that, but yeah, I, I'm not good at the gotcha kind of um, exploitation of, of moments who don't know they're being filmed, mm-hmm. um, but different, I'm sure for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Um, There's a lot. There's a lot here, so I'm just yeah. Go up. go ahead. No, I'm just. Uh, is there a question that? Uh, so Jack has a question. What inspires you to keep on creating? Um, uh, you know, it's it can be super hard work, um, and uh, to me, I've been lucky enough to really mostly work on films that I really believe in and that present a challenge and it really doesn't feel like going to work. I want to be there even, and sometimes especially when it means setting the alarm at 2.45 to wake up and trundle up the hill in the freezing cold with your gear to set up to get the sun, you know, whatever it is um, that uh, lots of people would think is like the worst shit job ever but i actually love that stuff so that that's that's an inspiration for me and also trying to find new new ways of doing it you and i have both more recently in our careers um uh started to work on installations video installations in in the different like in a gallery an art gallery setting um which for me as part of the anthropocene was an amazing challenge to try and think of these images that I'm I'm gathering and and you know imprinting uh, that are going to be shown in an entirely different context than a TV show or a linear you know film or a movie theater um, and how do you what's the established language and how how much should you subvert that and going through all I I, I really enjoyed um, that video installation challenge and I've had a few. Uh, examples of those in the last few years that I've been really happy with. Like, I would love to keep doing more of that if, and if the universe wants to keep inviting me to, or paying something, or making time for it. What, what about you? Yeah, I mean, the immersive experience. There's so much to that, right? And and to think about how else to create something visceral, or even more visceral than something that is just uh, in the theater. Um, 
I just, I'm, I'm interested in the things that I learn from being a part of, I, I really, I feel very much a part of the experience whenever I'm filming something. And that's always a really dynamic, that's, you know, thing in my life for, for me. And, and I really, I really identify with the variety of topics that I get to, to experience. And, and it's just, um, I think that's what it is. And it's also the people that, um, that I've come to work with. I've become friends with a lot of people that I've worked with once or twice. And, um, when there is an opportunity to, to relive, you know, to start another experience with these people that I love, um, I, it's very hard to, to turn that down. Um, so I don't know. I think it, it's less about the filming, but also maybe in terms of the technical side of things, um, wanting to to step out of yourself and your own modes of of working. Like I feel like I feel like I've become very comfortable setting up interviews and 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 just having a way of balancing a frame that's you know that I feel is is pleasing. Um, so it. it there's sort of this formula, I guess, in a way that, that I, that I work in. And I, I'm interested in also stepping out of that and, and reevaluating how my own, the, the trends that I've created for myself can be, can be pushed. Um, and I think that goes with, um, just to talk about interviews a little bit, there was a question about lighting and, and how, um, you know, just to answer that, um, but I, I, I usually find that it's quite simple too. In I'm always relying on natural light a lot of the time. A lot of the films that I work on require sort of this feeling of, of just sitting with somebody as opposed to an image being over here or a situation or, or, or gathering a lot with a wide lens. It's just, it's this personal connection of, of listening to somebody talk about whatever they want to talk about. Um, so I usually find a frame that is, near natural light or was motivated by some kind of, by that shape. And, and I just have um, a couple of LEDs that I've brought along. And for the last, I think, three years since I bought them, I haven't lit anything with more than that. Sometimes there's specialty equipment that you bring along, but really just mimicking natural light has been my thing. And um, I think there's a temptation to be stylized and there's a need that I, a personal need that I have to try something really funky sometimes. And whenever I think of going there with a film, it, I always back off because it, it never really feels right. So I think in a way I'm sort of looking for something where we can create something a little bit moodier and, and have a little bit more fun with the lighting. Would, but historically and typically that's how I've worked. Would you shoot a drama? Would you shoot something scripted to to be I, able to flex that muscle or? I think I would, because maybe this, maybe this isn't something that fits within the documentary that I get called for. So I am interested in shooting scripted. I did a little bit. I've done a couple of shorts um, over the years, not many. Um, but more recently, I shot a, a short digital series, um, which was a comedy. And it's called Hey Lady. And that, that was a full uh, sort of microcosm of what a series would would be and look like and and would feel like for me so that was that was fun i liked it and i wouldn't mind expanding into that world a little bit more so so i could try some things and step away from using the 24 to 105 <laughs> <for> the 20 <laughs> <laughs> experiment with some different looks i'm really into that it's just um i feel that my equipment and the aesthetic is very much governed by the subject matter and I feel like we always have to be loyal to that with what we do. The, the, that's very uh, courageous of you to have that ambition because that idea just petrifies me. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm always just trying to leverage reality as much as possible. And so, yeah, I travel with some small lights uh, that have changed over the years, but um, I, I'll only use them out of necessity if the reality doesn't you know somehow would be distracting uh, mm -hmm. in some deficiency of uh, of the lighting but i'm always trying to to think of how the picture can give context and tell a story even if it's a straight up interview especially sometimes if it's a straight up interview how can that environment kind of represent that person uh, mm -hmm. somehow especially if it's if it's in their home so um 
trying to use that reality, but the amount of, of artifice, like I never went to film school and, and I spent a bunch of years on big drama film sets. And that's kind of how I, um, you know, learned, learned a lot of amazing stuff, but to, mm -hmm to be the decision maker and to have to manufacture, um, you know, uh, all, using all of that, uh, um, all of those resources and people, uh, uh, that to me would be very daunting. If I were to shoot drama, it would have to basically be documentary. And, and th those lines, you know, blur all the time now with, mm -hmm. with them um, smaller, lighter, better cameras and just aesthetics and, and all of that. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, this question about speaking of lighting, I've lost a little bit. Oh yeah, lost a little bit here with <laughs> the sun going down. Who's who's gaffing this shoot anyway? I... Um, <laughs> so that's a good question. There's a question about um, primes and when do you uh, when do you switch focal lengths? Um, I've mostly been a zoom guy, but for me that's actually really topical because to your point about wanting to branch out and try different things. I have a current project that um, uh, is with um, a guy named Jason Logan in Toronto, who's a art director. And, and um, uh, his thing is that he forages his own artisanal ink uh, and he gives workshops of how to do this. And it's kind of like um, ink is to uh, images and words like vinyl is to music. So it's this kind of analog tactile um, expression in the age of ones and zeros and social media and digital stuff. Uh, and there's lots of, uh, lots of opportunity for sort of beautiful, um, you know, his stuff, his, the washy stuff he does as an artist with his own ink, um, is, is very, very beautiful and, and washy. And, um, when we shot the teaser, uh, down in death Valley in California, I actually got out the Epic again and, drove myself crazy again. So I'm back on the Amira, but I, I went with a, um, you know, small set of primes and that's exactly it. Right. Um, that, that kind of, uh, shallow depths of field and, and, uh, fluidity of, of operating like on my zoom, I, I, I never use the servo. I take the servo right off and I actually had to get Canon to add some drag to my, zoom barrel on the 17 to 120 because i will often do a live zoom but with my hand mm -hmm. uh, like the 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 warmth of that for me or snapping or whatever is kind of part of 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 operating um and uh then for this one the the primes are beautiful because there's lots of negative space that you want to leave in the frame on this one to replicate a page sometimes and probably to maybe fill in with stuff. So, um, it's just easier to do that, uh, with the faster uh, primes and just, just operating, you know, changing frame by, by moving in and out. Um, uh, and then, yeah, when to change, I mean, kind of when it stops feeling right. Um, or if you have time just to get a different feel of the same, the same kind of look, but, it takes time. I mean, especially on the Epic, uh, without the ND filter wheel, um, you know, all that stuff slows you down if you're missing stuff and you're frustrated. If you're swinging a lens, if you're having to change a four by five, six ND filter, if you're, you know, whatever else is kind of driving you crazy. So, um, I have a funny story about the Epic from, uh, ghosts in our machine, which oh, yeah. is about, about how animals get treated in the, in the food, uh, you know, industrial food chain and agricultural, uh, uh, supply lines. And we were filming, uh, actually I'll, I'll back up, but, uh, at one point the, the old Epic just started to overheat all the time and it gives you temperature readout on the back. And so you can watch this thing go up and then, you know, you can be in the middle of an interview and it's going up and up and up and it's, your heart's going up. It's like, shit, I'm going to have to, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. Um, and it was getting worse. And at one point, it like the fans turned on full to avoid a thermal shutdown in the middle of an interview. I said, okay, this is crazy. And I phoned them up and they said, yeah, yeah, we've got a thing where we're, we're upgrading the fans on the original ones. So send us the body. I said, I don't have time. It's like, all right, we'll send you the fan and step-by-step -step instructions. So I'm, I'm taking apart the Epic to replace the fan. And I put in the new one and, uh, and then, you, you know, you 
supposed to turn it on and new firmware and stuff. I turn it on and literally it was like a, a Benny Hill sketch or something. All of these little white feathers <laughs> fly out of the top of my Epic. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? There's feathers coming out of my, have, have like some old like acid molecule dislodged itself from somewhere deep in my body. And then I realized like a couple months before on Ghosts in Our Machine, we had been at a rescue farm and I was in a chicken coop and I'm always putting the camera on the ground and I must have not been looking and it must have hoovered up a lot of little downy chicken feathers and like a duh, my camera was overheating. There's like a down quilt somewhere in the, you know, vent system. <laughs> um, so solved that one, but the, the hazards of location. You got that dryer lint little door that you, that you didn't realize. You got to clean that once in a while. Yes, that's what I would need, I think. Oh. <laughs> uh, I got a text that Mike Reed says hello. Um, Mike Reed in my world deserves just a massive shout out. I mean, on Anthropocene. Um, he, yeah, I forgot where we met. I think on Discovery Show, like Machines or uh, one of those ones. And, um, you know, he and I have been friends for a long time and he would come along in the early days as supposedly a kind of helper but he's such a good shooter <laughs> and it's like no you go shoot that like i'll i'll help myself and i'm used to it and now he's just such a master of drones and gimbals and and uh you know uh great stuff so shout out back right. to mike reed um uh, what else do you think packing for different environments and situations it's a huge part of the job mm -hmm. we we you and i were talking about this a bit yesterday it's like um you know you have to get the shot and that means probably a decision you make in your basement sometimes like a week before you're there um and your shit has to be ready and the cards have to be cleared um because you don't you don't get a second crack at it um so i maybe have a bigger range on some of those ones like the Anthropocene can be everything from me alone shooting an interview kind of thing or even getting plates to yeah the 10 person crew and the drones and the you know all sorts of stuff um uh but if you travel with too much stuff then a lot of times you there's just too much inertia and you won't get the shot because you're you're dragging you know a bag of gear that that's slowing you down um, mm -hmm. or even when you leave that morning or when you leave the vehicle to go somewhere you can't get that piece back so the the packing and I've got a Tenba nap stack um, that I can even with the Amira I can put my put my tripod and my Amira and that nap sack and basically shoot a day now um, yeah. which I couldn't with the Epic uh, it was too much of a media and power hog but I can carry carry that kit kind of for a day and even interviews in the middle of the day you know the 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 terabytes add up on the road and mm -hmm. used to be you'd spend your night in the hotel downloading film mags and reloading for the next day and now it's like downloading a million cards and yeah. sometimes waking up in the middle of the night making sure you're awake enough to not erase something and mm -hmm. start the next set of downloads to have everything clear in the morning but um uh that's a that's a big part any any travel tips or things about uh, packing well for me i try to i mean i try to be as light as possible so i've i've really got things down to the smallest that i can and, and even then some people there's a range of reactions that i get when i meet people with my gear for the first time like oh this is great it's so compact i only carry about four four cases with me which includes the tripod and all my lights um or some people look at it and say, this is ridiculously a lot of gear. And so, you know, it's really up for interpretation, but I feel really comfortable with it. The thing that I find the most useful is to, well, to think about all the things that could go wrong. So if this cable goes, do I have another one? Um, where are we? If we're in Manhattan, that's fine. If we're in <laughs> Gong, Kenya, that's another story. Um, but, you know, just thinking about the environment and, um, but always, I have two Pelican Airs that I carry for my de completely de deconstructed camera and the lenses in the other case. 
But in that camera case, I make sure that I have everything I need to shoot a film. If everything else that gets checked under the plane does not arrive, which, which, it ha which has happened to me, um, do I have at least a couple of batteries and all the cards and, and one lens that I could just roll with? And I've had to do that sometimes. Um, but, uh, but apart from that, I just, I choose gear that, uh, you know, fits like a puzzle piece for me. And I just have this big suitcase that I put my lights and all my grip stuff and my, um, and my clothes in. And I feel like, um, part of that question was that it didn't necessarily include just film gear, but how else do we pack? And, um, you, you actually take extra clothes. You have do. room for that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I always find they're just, there's really not a lot of room <laughs> by the time you bought everything you want to bring. So something's got to give. But. There isn't, but I, I find that footwear is actually important because you, it, changing it helps you to not feel as tired. And I, yeah. I think that from, from people. So when you can switch that up, um, you know, and I've, I have very personal preferences about the things that have worked for me. Like I have waterproof shoes and, that are also very light and, um, yeah. and um, I'm a layers person. I'm also, I also have a very low tolerance for discomfort, like heat and cold. I find that very distracting when I'm working. So, um, you know, lots of layers and merino wool and <laughs> yeah. just getting in, uh, geeking out on, on all of that, you know, technical gear that makes me comfortable. Yeah. Um, but I always, I, I would never assume that it would never, would not get, cold or would not get, you know, I think some people are very confident when, uh, they don't pack the heaviest jacket that they have, you know, but you, you actually don't know. And sometimes you're called upon to, to step outside for hours on end. And there's that I, that's not sustainable for me if I'm not completely prepared. No, that's it. And that's part of the challenge is you never know when a film day is going to end and something you think might be a shorter interview, you can still be shooting at 10 at night. Um, and it's cold and dark, but something's happened or there's, you know, um, just the, the narrative has moved on and you need to move with it. And it's maybe not what you had planned for. So you have to plan for those things you didn't plan for. Mm -hmm. I always, always try and do that as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, big, big leaf bags, sunscreen, mm -hmm. um, you know, hat, those kinds of things just live in the, in the camera knapsack. Uh, lens cleaner obviously and then just trying to make the right selection of of lenses um yeah. and that's that can sometimes be your day and and mm -hmm. um yeah go to make it work yeah i carry the same lens kit all the time so i don't really have to think about that but um <laughs> kind of nice <laughs> But I can appreciate how, like, you have the choice between swinging some primes, uh, like a prime set as well as the zooms that you normally use. So, yeah, which I I couldn't carry them all in a knapsack. So, I mean, if you're working out of a car, great. Um, and um, but yeah, all of those all those levels down. When you leave your house, what fits on the plane? Um, uh, you know, Mike Reed and I, Mike built those pipes for the front of the train and mm -hmm. there's all those considerations it's like yeah you can spec it out back home but it also has to be within spec for air canada luggage right i mean thank god uh, like elite air canada you still get three bags at 70 pounds there's no other right. airline in the world lets you fly three bags at 70 pounds um uh so that's that's a help sometimes um, unless you're unless you're by yourself, um, have you ever had this situation? Um, it's interesting, just because they were the top story uh, on the uh, CBC News this morning. The Citizen Lab. I did this film called Black Code that I also directed. It was maybe the closest I got to behind the scenes. Um, where I was traveling on a visa sometimes that was not, it was a tourist visa and I had to kind of have a tourist camera kit, not a professional kit um, to go to Pakistan and Brazil and some places that would not have issued me film permits for what I was doing. Um, but more than that, I, I think this is kind of a, 
a, a newer thing in the age of of surveillance um but i had to really uh get my act together about data security and integrity and encryption because i was gathering interviews from people who were in who were incredibly vulnerable and if my um uh interviews you know they trusted me with that but if that had been seized at the border um that could have uh seriously smashed the first principle of journalism of do no harm where i would have been responsible for potentially serious repercussions to that person so it's it's morally incumbent on me to minimize that that threat and that was a whole new way of working i i hadn't had to think of uh before about that level of encryption and the the sort of chain of custody of that data until i can get it home um uh where it's more safe uh and then make make decisions you know about what's appropriate and what's risky and and what's not uh, i thought that was um i'm sure all frontline human rights defenders who are gathering uh any kind of video uh and more and more in this world where the tentacles of of uh surveillance you know are reach into darker and darker places and in ways that we don't know um that practice is going to be more and more important for certain kinds of documentary filmmaking mm -hmm. uh i think just to keep the integrity of your of your data until you can edit it and package it the way that mm -hmm. you want um it speaks to protecting your subject just in a more general way too um and having responsibility for the fact that you are pointing a camera at them what what that means for their community um, what risks you put them, what, you know, you put people through with your presence. And um, yeah, I was, I was in a situation recently where that lesson also came really to the foreground where um, you're asking somebody to spend time with you um, to be in a documentary, to bring light to their, to their story, which is, which is very important. Of course, they're on board with that, but um it doesn't mean that you can ruin their lives. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, there's this moment recently where we were doing an interview and this conflicted and overlapped with something that somebody needed to do, um, which was to go to an embassy. Like they had a very important um, meeting with an embassy in order to get out of the country eventually. And we nearly prevented them from from making it to that meeting. We were an hour out of the city. We promised to get them back in time. Mm. And when you're in that space um, of, of speaking to this person and, and getting all this great stuff that you need, you, you so often lose sight of, of what the purpose of your being there was in the first place. And you, there's a certain hunger to, to doing what we do, especially with the camera, to, to be getting as much as possible. You, you feel like you're fulfilling this great need. Um, and sometimes the film takes precedent over, <laughs> over the life. And, and we, we nearly, I mean, we really messed up in that, that moment and we nearly did not allow her to get back in time. Um, I know this is not exactly what you were talking about, but just in terms of protecting people, like to keep them in mind when you're working with them, that there's nothing more important than, than their life. And the few minutes or the extra question that you might have at the end does not outweigh <laughs> the, the, um, their well-being. Anyway. Absolutely right. No, exactly. Um, yeah, someone who's who's giving you an authentic and intimate moment is putting a huge trust in you. Mm -hmm. um, so always trying to be worthy of and respectful of that trust, I think, is a, a big part of of ethical documentary practice. Mm -hmm. On a on a way lighter note, I'm looking at the fridge in the background of your uh, camera frame. Yes. And um, here's here's a tip for anyone who wants uh, for documentary: when the sound of that fridge motor is killing your your interview, so you ask if you can turn it off. Put your car keys in the fridge, because, like you say, things one thing leads to another. You have this incredible cathartic time. Maybe people cry. It's hours later. You're wrapping up. Thank you so much. Wonderful. If you forgot that you turned their fridge off, you get the call the next day about their ice cream and okay. uh, that stuff. And um, 
if you put your car keys in, you don't forget because you can't actually leave <laughs> until you remember you turned the fridge off. So and you just reminded me that I have to turn my fridge back on because I did turn it off for this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Excellent. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're coming to the end. Mm -hmm. We should be wrapping up. Do you have any kind of mantras or philosophies or things that have helped you kind of be be mindful in the moments of of shooting well <laughs> um i mean there are but i think over the years of you know if there's a takeaway it, it's for me the experience that i build is is so much folk, uh, weighted towards the experience of knowing myself better and, and being a better shooter and building on knowledge has more to do with understanding why I might have made a mistake or you know even when gear goes down it is caused by something and like to, to deconstruct why what those reasons are um, always comes back to some kind of interpersonal struggle <laughs> I think and so you know improving myself over the years has been about just getting to know myself better. And there are peripherals to that and things that are connected with that in terms of how you relate and how you communicate with people and, and how you handle physically handle the things around you. But um, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's that. And I would encourage anybody to, you know, who wants to, to get into this to, to really look within themselves um, for that learning. And, and also, I guess, just that the trajectory of, of my career has been more about, um, and you know, with the films that I work on, very much about thinking about who I am behind the camera and, and how, I, how that camera is to behave through, through what I see through it. And I think in films like Stories We Tell and A Better Man and, and This River, which is a, about uh, an Indigenous community, being a good listener through the camera has been really important and, and thinking about and constantly evaluating in that moment who I'm supposed to be has, has informed the language of those films. And I feel like that's been really important to, to realize over time and to, to use as a way of sort of a method. For me. How about you? I, I, I mean, I think that's just amazingly eloquently put. <laughs> Thank so thank you for that. I think that's that's probably a great place to to maybe leave it. Do you think? I think that's a wonderful well, wrap up. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't have anything to add to that? I I, I, I like don't that? think I could I could say it better about how much the sort of personal investment um, uh, informs you know work that that you become happy with and and um, uh, yeah. It is, it is a kind of a, a mirror back on to you somehow that you learn from all the time. Maybe that's what, what keeps drawing me to it as well. That mm. doesn't get tired um, uh, or doesn't feel like I'm repeating myself different every time. Right. Because you're different every time, you know. Um, yeah. Um, we are very happy to introduce that uh, Mark Irwin CSC and Matt Irwin associate member CSC um, look back on their work uh, next week and uh, it's a father and son team Thursday May 14th at 12 o'clock EST uh, is the next installment of this series so hope everyone can tune into that um, and uh, we're supposed to say how um, people can get in touch with us and follow us. I'm on, uh, I, I have a website, mercuryfilms.ca is probably the best way. And that has the socials and things like that as well. Yeah. Uh, my website is iriscinematography.com. And that's all I have <laughs> to get in touch with me, but feel free. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions too, whenever um, people have them. I try to do my best and this is also a good time while we're sharing and learning so this has been really fun Nick thank you thank you Iris yeah good good to hang out <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See you soon in person, hopefully. I know. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everybody okay. for joining us.